After US President Ronald Reagan saw this, he wrote in his diary that it was very effective and had left him greatly depressed, and not long afterwards the superpowers adopted a policy of arms reduction culminating in the signing of the Intermediate Nuclear Arms Force Treaty in Reykjavik. So in summary, Steve Gutenberg saved the world. Thanks Steve! Don't make any more films. Thanks to Gutenberg's selfless sacrifice, today's world isn't facing all-out nuclear war between two superpowers, yet it feels more chaotic and perilous than it did back in the 80s. Perhaps because the presentation of current affairs has become more chaotic and perilous. It's almost a hyper-edited, real-time, televisual thriller. Tonight, can the world come together to confront a rogue nation? Today, tuning into the news is like looking directly into the face of terror. A chilling new look tonight at the face of terror. Video of a suicide bomber smiling for the camera as he gets ready for his deadly mission in Afghanistan. This is like a jihadist 24. It's got that, that, that tension in it that you can't really turn yourself away. And you can't really turn yourself away because you're biologically programmed to pay attention to any potential threat. The amygdala may fire off in response to the pre-programmed terrors we're born with, instinctive fear of loud noises and sudden movements and the like, but it's also easy for them to help us learn to fear almost anything. Television can certainly condition you to be frightened of all sorts of things. For example, dark city streets. Most of the dark city streets you see are on television. And what's happening in them? Well, usually something awful like a mugging or a murder, or at best a horrific sexual encounter involving a tramp and a bull mastiff if you're watching German television. In the 1970s, professors George Gerbner and Larry Gross of the University of Pennsylvania carried out pioneering research into the effect of television on viewers. They believed that within a few decades, television had come to enjoy a degree of influence on modern society that was comparable to the power religion held over mankind for centuries. Gerbner and Gross developed a hypothesis known as cultivation theory. Cultivation theory says that over time, watching television alters a viewer's perception of reality, that their view of the real world starts to march in step with that of the televised one. And the more frequently an image or event is depicted on screen, the greater significance the cultivated viewer attaches to it in the real world. Since much of TV consists of dramatic conflict, violent action and alarming news coverage, the more you watch, the more passive, nervous and frightened you become. Gerbner called this mean world syndrome, quite literally the belief that your world has become a mean and frightening place. Gerbner's research appeared to show that heavy viewers often overestimated the amount of risk they faced in everyday life. They were more likely to believe crime rates were rising even when they were falling and often thought they were more likely to become victims of crime themselves. <laughs> <sighs> and switching it off doesn't make you feel any safer, because now that's shut up, you're more aware than ever of the glowering silence all around. What was that? Hello? Hello? Is there someone there? I'll, I'll call the police. Oh, oh piss. Crime Watch began in 1984 and was originally fronted by concerned parental types Nick Ross and Sue Cook. They were assisted by an aquarium full of coppers and a duo of plausibly stilted police presenters. This knife is believed to have been used in the attack. But the real stars were the accompanying gallery of apparently furious and anonymous men perpetually glaring at you, like the participants in a special Strangeways edition of the board game Guess Who. Slightly more realistic suspects and actors peopled the rest of the show, popping up in murky CCTV footage and posing for reconstruction snaps like they were modelling the latest in fashionable crime wear. The most frightening crime of all is, of course, murder. Oh, God! And there's no danger of a TV murder shortage anytime soon. Not that regular murderers are dangerous enough for the televised world where they're routinely depicted as criminal geniuses playing a diabolical game of cat and mouse with a troubled police detective wearing the worried expression of a bloodhound opening a court summons. Yes, according to television, most killers are artisan killers whose every offering deserves to be analysed for literary merit and they're markedly more vicious than almost any of their real-life equivalents. Take the maniac running riot in the inaugural episode of The Dark Moody Wire in the Blood, which featured a madman who specialised in creating diabolical implements of torture in the most upsetting Blue Peter makes ever captured on tape. Oh, I've got one of those, actually. It's the Ikea Spiken seat. 
Like the best TV monsters, this killer also sent tapes of his victims to taunt the police. We've just received this from the post room addressed to Bradfield CID. Hi. I'm the police constable, Damien O'Connell. Hi, Damien. How's it going? Oh, not so good then. A typical police sitting on their ass. Of course, most real-life murderers aren't unstoppable artistic killing machines, but somewhat pathetic oh. individuals who've done something awful in an ill-thought-out panic. Mm. And most of them simply don't know what to do after committing their crime. It's not like there's an advice hotline they can turn to. Welcome back. Now, if you've just joined us, the former Beast of Brighton, rehabilitated murderer Ashley Studd, is answering your queries. So if you've just killed somebody, do call in. Uh, for now, on line three, we've got Sue from Gosforth. Sue... What's happened? Blood is everywhere. I mean, there's blood everywhere. I can't feel my hands. I don't even know if these are my hands. Well, Sue, or... Sue, take a step back mentally. Catch your breath. Quieten your mind as much as you can. So you've, you've literally just murdered someone, have you, Pat? Yeah, I think... I... And, and everything yeah. seems a bit unreal. Yeah. Well, that's, that's normal. That's absolutely what I'd expect to find. His eyes open. His eyes open. Never mind his eye. That'd stay open even if you sawed his head off. Have you got a top on, a blouse or...? I'm in a T-shirt. OK. What I want you to do is take it off and drape it over his face. That'll stop you looking in his eye. And we've got to get rid of the clothing you're wearing anyway because of DNA. Can you do that for me? I'm, I'm doing it now. Good girl. I can't feel my hands. What was that, Sue? She keeps saying she can't feel her hand. Yes, that's the adrenaline. It's a fascinating mindset. I used to think I could climb into the air in the room or that my brain was made of stallions. Oh, can it? Right, now, you need to chuck the rest of your clothes on him, set fire to the house and leave town. TV loves presenting you with fearful tales of murder, but it's often a curiously reassuring type of fear which reinforces the notion that real life follows a dramatic narrative in which the dastardly villains are brought to justice. When undeniably random bad things do make it on screen, TV processes them on your behalf, turning them into titillation in shows like The Enthusiastic 999, which enabled viewers to enjoy mindless emergencies in the comfort of their own homes. Tonight, the little boy who was swept over a waterfall. <laughs> and the teenagers who came to the rescue. Boo! 999 justified its existence by alerting the public to important issues like life belt theft. 4,000 life belts like this one are stolen or go missing every year. Yeah, people just toss them in the sea. It's an outrage. It also afforded Michael Burke an opportunity to ask the important questions. Have you ever thought what it'd be like to be stuck in the path of a giant digger? No, why don't you paint a picture for me? 999's jaunty, low-budget reconstructions look altogether genteel compared to the effects-laden reconstruction extravaganzas of today. Shows like Air Crash Investigation, which ostensibly exist to give you a greater insight into airline safety, but are actually all about giving your fear cells a cheeky tickle. Air Crash Investigation combines impressive special effects with an almost pornographic focus on the human terror of the passengers and crew. There's also dialogue torn from the black box recorder and shoved in the mouths of actors. Push it up! Push it way up! Way up! Way up! Way up! Now, you know, the surprisingly racy dialogue on these black box recorders. In fact, you could probably run an entire adult channel where girls read it out for the benefit of people who can't decide whether they prefer air crashes or masturbating. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up. Way up. Anyway, much like the best pornography, Air Crash Investigation features lots of tense, stick-gripping action, sweaty shots of a Ron Jeremy type juddering away, and of course the inevitable money shot. Even though you're 20 times more likely to die during the drive to the airport than you are on the plane, chances are this is the kind of dramatic image your brain has helpfully associated with air travel. Apparently concerned it might be running out of nasty real-life threats to warn you about, TV has started visually speculating about bad stuff that hasn't happened but might. One day, the world will end. In recent years, there's been a slew of scary, hand-wringing, what-if drama documentaries depicting what could occur if things got even more dangerous for humankind than they already are. We've seen spectacular simulations of what might happen if Yellowstone Park suddenly blew up, hard-hitting investigations into what might happen if the sun suddenly ballooned in size. This is a world we can barely imagine and spine-tingling visualisations of how things might look if a large hadron collider went a bit amstrad. 
In fact, it sometimes seems there's no end to TV's perpetual quest to helpfully alert the viewer to new potential threats. In television's hypothetical universe, danger could spring from literally anywhere. Morning. Britain's homes and offices contain an estimated three billion pens. The rise of computers may have dented their popularity, yet millions of us rely on pens every day. But what would happen if these apparently harmless writing implements turned on their users by heating up inexplicably? Written communication is one of mankind's greatest achievements. It evolved over centuries, yet today we take it for granted. If our ability to produce handwritten notes were to be affected by an unexpected increase in pen temperature, it could have grave consequences for every man, woman and child on the planet. By 10 a.m., manual writing implements nationwide are being hastily abandoned. There are widespread injuries with casual office doodlers amongst the first casualties. In the markets of Soho, stallholders can no longer price up their vegetables. Fortunately, in today's modern workplace, forgoing pens isn't the hindrance it once was. But by lunchtime, the heat is spreading to computer keyboards. If typing became impossible, or at best, extremely painful, it would transform the online world in an instant. Internet speech would become even more incomprehensible and angry than ever. Anxious citizens turn to news networks for information. But with no typewritten text on the autocue, news anchors are powerless to help. The government calls an emergency meeting to grab hold of the situation. We won't get through this by meaninglessly jabbering over each other like dogs on a speedboat. We need to keep a cool head. OK, we need to collate what we know and then... Hold on. Disaster strikes at mid-afternoon as people's voices start to get hot. Soon, there will be no way for humans to communicate at all, plunging our planet into a new dark age and eventually causing it to explode altogether. Alarming though much of television is as we stare into our screens, desperately gazing into the light like a rodent suckling at a consolatory teat, the warning box is comforting us even as it scares. It says if you obey the man, you can avoid danger. It transforms random calamity into Hollywood-style entertainment, rendering it less real. It says the good guys will defeat the evil guys. And it says Steve Gutenberg can save the world. It makes sense of our universe in a way that's as soothing as it is fake. Morning! And what's more, it gets away with it. And that is frightening. Hugh Dennis and some of the freshest comedy talent around play fast and loose with improvisation. Friday at 10 here on BBC Two. And to have a laugh now, BBC Three is the place to be with the lively coming of age gang. <laughs>